many times and then how often yeah, did I, we get I, this I, exact I was same sniffing, number? I was sniffing data and um, the sniffing setup was kind of convol convoluted because I used a logic analyzer which had uh, some Windows software. So I had a VMware running that had the Windows software for the logic analyzer and then I had my Linux machine which ran the, anal uh, the, the decoding software that would analyze the logic analyzer output and I needed to copy data from the VMware into my Linux machine to run the decoder. And to get samples, I simply used an open PCD and uh, had a power switch in the power line of the open PCD. And to get a new sample, I just switched the open PCD off and on. So it would start new, it would generate a new field, and the card would be initialized, and uh, the open PCD would authenticate to the card right away at almost always the same time. And then I captured that in my logic analyzer and analyzed that. and. The first two attempts were the same. I got the same random number. I was kind of uh, confused because that is not supposed to happen. That's a random number. Maybe I copied the same file twice or did something wrong by copying from the VMware to the Linux machine. So I tried that again and got the same number again, but with a different uh, part after that. So there were, was a di different random number from the reader, but the same random number from the card. So obviously it was not the same file, but still the same random number from the card. And then I did like 23 trials of that in half an hour. And out of these 23, I got 12 times the same random number from the card and six times the same random number from the reader. So in total I had six completely identical th traces from 23 trials without doing anything special on the reader. I just had a reader that would authenticate right away after being switched on. And because it's a reader, it's in firmware, it doesn't have any timing uh, problems, it would generate the same timing most of the time yeah. by accident. Very much reminded us of, of this <laughs> random number generator, what we saw there. Okay, moving on. Um, another um, set of attacks, and these are now the really interesting ones, the ones that, that break cryptographic assumptions. Um, and we'll only go over those that, that apply generally, that is not just to MyFact Classic. There's a bunch of things you can, you can do to just break the crypto one. It's kind of boring since it's already broken. And so these are things you can always do. The, the idea of a cryptographic break is to reverse a function that is supposed to be one way. So any encryption function, hash function, what have you in your cryptographic toolkit is a function that you, that you should be, with ease, be able to compute in one direction, given the secret key, but never in the other direction, at least not unless you have a secret key. Now, and we are breaking this assumption, and there's, there's many ways to, to, to break this. Um, and as I said, I'll, I'll go over them generally, and then uh, Henrik adds what you can do to my fair classic. Um, the first and easiest and most obvious is to try all possible keys. One will fit. And in the, in the analogy of a normal key that you use to open your door, um, the, the key is th there are more keys as the, the shape of the key gets more complex. So imagine one of these American normal house keys. They usually only have five T's. And say these five T's could only either be high or low. So there's 32 possibilities of what the key could look like. And the easiest to get into the door is to have 32 different keys. Try them all. One will fit. Now, computers are a lot faster at trying keys. They can try a few billion keys a second, depending on the crypto algorithm. Um, but there are all the keys that they use also have a lot more T's, or bits in this case. And the more bits you have, the, the harder it becomes to, to try out of possible keys. And so that is why the bit lengths should be at least a certain minimum. And in symmetric ciphers today, we're talking about 80 bits minimum um, for internet-grade security. Now, the MIFA Classic card uses, for instance, 48-bit keys. That's clearly below that threshold. But depending on the application, you could say anything um, up to 64 bits is, is weak and breakable in some way um, if the incentives and, or the stakes are high enough for somebody to attempt to break the key and has sufficient hardware resources. Yeah, the MIFA Classic has 48 bits, as we've already said, which is really weak. You can imagine a PDF encryption is, was usually 40 bits, and you would break that on your home PC in a weekend. 48 is not that much more. Um, the brute force key search um, 
on the protocol works only if you know the protocol. If you don't know the protocol, you need to uh, do a brute force attack on the card, which would take kind of longer because the card is kind of slow and only gets one attempt every six milliseconds, I think. So if you would try all possible keys against one card, you'd take 50,000 years, something like that. But if you know the, the algorithm, you can just implement the algorithm on your own computer, which can be as fast as you want, or you can implement it on FPGA, which can be even faster. And um, you can build an FPGA that cracks the key, or somebody has built an FPGA that cracks the key in 50 minutes for a couple of thousand dollars, I think. So um, that's, quite, that's quite fast already with specialized hardware. Yeah, if I may add to that, so one, um, one of the features of this card that we probably broke was the security through obscurity. If your only access to the system is through the defined API, through asking the card to please verify whether what you computed is correct, you indeed need 200,000 years to break a single key. Once you know the algorithm and can implement it on your own hardware, that, that number goes down to 50 minutes. So please do never rely on obscurity in, in your security design and to never assume that even though you, n you never told anybody your algorithm, nobody knows it. They can find it and we found this one, for instance, through reverse engineering the chip itself and clearly you have to give the chip to your customers. That's how you make money. Moving on, other um, cryptographic attacks that apply generally. There's, there's this whole field of time memory trade-offs and the idea here is to compute a code book. Now think of, a, of this one-way function as a secret language. So every, every word that you can come up with, every bit string, has a, an equivalent in the other language. And only you and whomever you communicate with speaks that language. So the encryption would be to translate it from your language into that secret language. Now one way to break it would be a dictionary. If somebody had a dictionary, the reverse way, the secret language into your language, that would be the decryption. Now building such a dictionary um, is usually impossible because there's so many different words. Again, the number of bits in the key determines how large the dictionary is. And if there's 48 bits in the key, then there's two to the 48 possible bit strings or entries in your dictionary. But there's, there's points in between the two extremes of building the entire dictionary and trying every key one by one. So you can compute parts of the dictionary or even the entire dictionary, but not store it, um, but store it co rather compressed. So the, the technique that is used is called rainbow tables. Um, and in those rainbow tables, you all, the, Put the most simple way, you just write down the first and the last word of every dictionary page. But since the dictionary is structured in a certain way, if you find the first, uh, or rather the last word of the page, you can, pr you can compute the entire page again very quickly and then find the word in the middle that you were looking for. And there are trade-offs. They, they are somewhere um, trading off more pre-computation time that always goes in as a, as a variable, um, but then in the actual attack trade off time and space. So the more space resources, meaning hard disk, you throw at the problem, the quicker you can break keys. And 48-bit is, is very doable um, for time memory trade offs in fact, almost easy. Um, they've been breaking 64-bit keys with, with ease now, with, um, with time memory trade-offs and the GSM cracking project that unfortunately came to an almost complete stop now. They have pre-computed um, exactly these compressed code books to break GSM communication, 64-bit keys. So for, um, for the MyFair Classic case, 48-bit key, um, do, do you have the numbers? R roughly? I think it was uh, like a couple of terabytes, which is really affordable <coughs> in space, will get you a full break on a normal PC, not FPGA, no special hardware, except the hard disks, in an hour or so. So for, for a few hundred dollars or euros in hardware resources, meaning hard disks, you get an attack platform that breaks you single keys in, in, in seconds, or definitely under a minute. Um, and this, oh. let me stress that, works in every 48-bit cipher. It didn't yet detect anything special about this cipher, any weakness. So the, 
the sheer fact that the, the key is too short allows for this and also allows for the brute force attacks. So whenever you find a crypto system that uses a key anything below 64 bits, you can do this attack. Um, more advanced attacks. And these are really fun. This is, this, this is almost cutting-edge research. So the, this, this is a new idea almost. Um, I said your goal is to reverse a one-way function. Now, you can do this by writing out a code book. You can do this by trying out every possibility and seeing which one matches. Or you can simply try to do it mathematically. If a function can be computed in one direction, maybe there's a way to compute it the other, other way. And unless you're an, uh, a super genius mathematician, you probably want to rely on the knowledge of other mathematicians. And mathematicians have created what they call the set solvers, satisfiability solvers. Um, over many years now, and they've been really perfected to, do the, to reverse uh, functions or to, to solve problems that we know have a solution, we just don't know what the solution is. And the, 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 price, the most prize-winning ones, these are some of the trophies, um, is Miniset and Mate Sos from, from Inria. He was, uh, he was just ingenious in, in using Miniset and to porting it so that Miniset now can, can be used to break crypto problems. So all, all you do to reverse a cipher now is describe the cipher mathematically, in mathematical terms, in, in equations. That's fairly straightforward. The next slide will, will illustrate that. Um, <clears throat> and then give this one instance of the problem, meaning you, ha you know what went in and you, you know what came out, you just don't know the secret key. Give this instance of the problem to the satisfiability solver and it will find the one key that makes the equations work out. Right? Really, that's straightforward. And just to, to show you how straightforward this has been come, uh, become, let's, let's just for, for fun um, run run one instance here of, of the, the MyFair cracker. Um. Yeah, so this is an application of the satisfiability <coughs> problem that you probably learned about in theoretical computer science if you're studying <coughs> computer science at the university and always wondered, why am I doing this? Why am I being cho told about a satisfiability problem? What's that good for? So this, this is, is what's good for. This is now going through a stage that we call guess and determine. What we do is we guess a few of the key bits um, say six bits, so there's only, no, in this case I think it's, yeah, six bits, so there's 64 um, possibilities of what these six bits could be, and only one is right. So we give it 63 guesses that are wrong and it will tell us it's unsatisfiable, and one of the guesses will be correct, so the, the remaining key bits uh, will work out. And this is now running on my slow Mac on battery, but it shouldn't take more than like 40 or 45 seconds to, to reverse this entire cipher and give us all the remaining key bits. Yeah, this is uh, running on a sniffed uh, <coughs> test example with uh, a key, with the standard key of FF, 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 exactly. FF, and so on. So the last bytes that came out of here is the secret key. We just reversed from an overheard uh, sniff of MIFA communication, we broke the secret key by throwing this problem at, at a mathematical tool. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, so what, what exactly did we do? Well, we described, <laughs> <coughs> we described the function, and now I'm showing just the filter function. Um, the, the binary table that, that maps the, the secret state into what we observe, the output bits. It's um, simple binary equations. Each of these can be um, seen as a lookup table, a 4 to 1 and then a 5 to 1 lookup table. So we write out these lookup tables, or rather the, the binary equations behind them. Um, we take 50-some instances, meaning output bits. For each of those, we write out the, the, um, the filter function. And the, the one last step is then to, to compute from those, those 50 different, 50-some 50 different secret states are a linear function of each other because it's a linear feedback shift register. Some of you might know what that is. And so we, we, come, we um, arrive at, at a few hundred equations, short equations, 
and those are enough given to the set solver to break this, this crypto problem. So this is no rocket science and could probably be done with pretty much any low complexity cipher. So now we're really attacking the, the nature of this piece. We're not attacking the key size anymore. We're not attacking the, the